Hello, everybody. You able to hear me now? Yep. I can hear you. You're good, Todd. All right. Thank you. Glad everybody could make it today to cover over this. Oh, I need to share my screen. Hold one second. And all right, let me get caught up here. Okay, so today we wanted to reach out and offer this up to help people that are switching their workforce to be partially remote, fully remote and share our experiences. I myself, for the better part of 20 years, have, have been working remote. Um, GSI is a remote company. We do have some offices around the country, but a majority of our workforce is remote. So we're gonna cover today both some technical aspects at a high level. I'm sure most everybody or every company, it's very unique, but we wanna cover some of the technology and planning aspects around remote workforce. And then the bulk of it at the end or towards the last half will be focused on the, the pros and cons, the pitfalls, um, benefits around remote workforce, things that we've learned over the years and wanna share it with folks so that they can benefit from it without the pains of learning the lessons. <laughs> um, but we are here to help Today is going to be a lot of high level um, things that we are aware of and can help with. If you want to reach out with us and get with our subject matter experts and your different teams, depending on where your needs are, uh, please reach out to us. We would like to help and get people over these issues and hurdles as best we can help. All right. Uh, the big thing is identifying scope, um, sitting down and reviewing, especially with the team managers or team leads of different groups, what tools do they use daily basis that are going to be required to work remote? Um, the more and more companies go cloud-based um, with their tools. A great example is Office 365. You're able to hit that from anywhere. A lot of people use that to check their emails at home. Um, so those are a lot easier to enable a remote workforce, but a lot of companies also have in-house software that they've developed that is a bit trickier. Um, we feel the best thing to start out with is identify all the tools that they need and then classify those that are already remote capable. They're able to hit it without being on the network or within the domain, which ones are internal only. And getting that identified is really the first step so that uh, you can resolve the issues of the systems inside and outside so here's kind of a listing of the different software products. This is at a high level, just as an example. Um, you know, external, you might have Office 365, which covers the core things that you need for remote workforce. Email, instant messaging, and video conferencing are key. Being remote and not in an office setting, communication is critical. Um, getting people to share the communication via these tools, um, being able to reach out instead of walking over to somebody's desk, being able to jump on instant messaging and ping somebody for a quick question. Uh, video conferencing, it helps with the personal touch and keeps people that not so distanced um, you get to still see expressions and things of that nature that are sometimes lost in written communication like I am in email. Um, time tracking. 
There's tools like NetSuite, uh, which we use, that's cloud capable and external. Um, a lot of clients have in-house tools that are uh, not out on the internet. And uh, ERP solutions, just because they, sorry, I'm having little difficulty with the slide deck. Scrolling ahead. Um, with the Enterprise One or JD Edwards, you know, that might be very locked down inside the domain. Um, that's a very common thing. Some clients will have one web server out in the DMZ and that's an option. Um, so reviewing and determining what you have as far as the tools and what's available quickly and which ones are internal only will help. Uh, all right. Uh, so in the next here, the remote options. Once you've identified which software products and tools are in which state, um, it's going to help you determine your remote options. Uh, company issued computers, uh, it's a very high cost. There's a lot of time to set that up. We've heard of clients going, you know, and ordering upwards of a thousand laptops. The time to configure all those and set them up and get them to your user base is going to be very consuming. Uh, laptops fail. There can be problems. There's the support side. What's the replacement turnaround time? Are users going to be down for a couple hours or a week to get a new laptop issued? Uh, supporting a, a large workforce all on laptops, your help desk and support teams. Are they ready for that? Are they knowledgeable and going to be able to handle that? Uh, then you've got VPN that's going to need to be set up for, to connect those remote laptops. There's a cost associated with that. There's infrastructure required for that. And um, Sorry, my slide deck has got a mind of its own today. Yeah, you know, I, I would like to point out, you're experiencing one of the issues that is very common with remote workforces. <laughs> and, and, you know, with, with Todd struggling with this and communication, it's, it, it is, this doesn't happen when you're face to face. So I just wanted to right. speak, on, speak on that. We're, we're living some of the things that, you know, you'll see if you ha aren't used to it now. Yep. No, it's a very good point. And honestly, to be open about it, I came into our Arizona office today because there's better internet. I knew I was going to be presenting, and it's a couple miles from my house. Nobody else is in, um, and I'm still running into a couple quirks. Uh, but back on this, um, you can take a look at the option of the DMZ. Uh, what would it take to spin up an extra web server to put, say, J.D. Edwards out in the DMZ and make that accessible? It's pretty doable, not too long to configure that. There's, It's complex with the security around a DMZ, making sure that you do it right and it's set up and configured correctly so that uh, you don't open up your DMZ to a large issue of letting a hole in your your system and allowing other opportunist people into the tool or into your domain. Uh, and thirdly, Amazon Workspaces or Azure Virtual Desktop. This is a real option here, um, a lot quicker than laptops and getting those set up. It's a lower cost up front. It is typically one day, maybe two, to configure and set up. Uh, it's basically a private cloud and build out your virtual desktop platform. What apps do you need on it and set it up for your company specific needs. And then set up the, an IPsec tunnel from that virtual private cloud to your domain. It 
then the users, the end users working remote would just connect in with any web browser and you're not having to deal with supporting hardware or personal computers that you don't know what condition they're in. Virus software is, you know, you set it up once on the base image and it's set. Um, if you're talking about, I know some people are looking at setting up uh, remote users on their personal computers. Your number one thing is virus software and VPN software. Is it going to work on those personal computers? What's it going to find right off the bat for software or virus issues? It's a very, very large load on your support teams. Um, where with these workspaces and virtual desktops, there's a base image and it clones as users log in. The cost is very low. Um, the smallest footprint, two gig, one CPU, or sorry, two gig of RAM, one CPU, enough to run some web browser apps and some small, you know, front end apps. You're looking at 1.6 cents per computing hour while users are connected. The next step up, which gets into two CPUs and four gig of RAM, you're looking at around five or six cents an hour. For 50 users, uh, nine to five, or 40 hours a week for a month, you're looking around $180 to $500 a month. That right there is about half the cost or less than a laptop. And that puts 50 users in a secure, clean, easier to support model. Excuse me while I jump around. Um, easier to support the clone. I mean, people log out, you declone that workstation, have them log back in. Um, some clients may want to do the virtual desktop workspace option short term to address the immediate need. And you may look at, you know, certain teams are going to require laptops and do a hybrid of the two options. So just wanted to kind of share those out there as possible solutions. And we've worked with all of them. Uh, we use Azure in-house uh, as an emergency jump box solution in case a employee's laptop goes down. The time for us to turn around a new laptop, we have immediate option for them to continue working. Um, so definitely reach out to us if you want to discuss or need help configuring any of these. Uh, we have experience on them. And John, I'll let you cover the security. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Yeah, um, you know, um, Todd mentioned, and I'd like to reiterate, G GSI's been around for, we're on our 16th year. Um, we've been a remote company the entire time. 16 years ago, it wasn't so, it wasn't so common. Um, and we're hoping um, to help offset um, some of those things. Um, and I'm going to start this section um, by giving you a really good example. Um, I have a relative who works for um, Humana, um, a healthcare provider. Uh, one day the relative, um, and, and this relative gets to work from home almost all the time, very fortunate um, for, for her. Um, I personally can't stand working from home. I, I like to be in an office with people. Um, but for her, it works out great. She's still got a little girl and it, daycare, and it, it's, it's just making things a little easier for her. But her internet went out. Okay, and this was around the holidays, and I don't know if you know much about, uh, um, in, you know, healthcare insurance, but that's the busy time of the year. They have they're an all hands on deck type of type of company at that at that case. So she said, "Hey, can I come over? I'm required to be connected. I can't continue to work with an outage at home." And I said, "Sure." So she shows up at my door half hour later, and she's got all of this equipment in her hands and I'm like what I just thought you were gonna come over and hook your laptop up to my internet she's like now you know we're we're a healthcare provider we we require not only um, IDs but we have to have our own specialty equipment um, to, to get on the network and and I couldn't even hook her up to the, our, our Wi-Fi because that was insecure at home so I you know I, I didn't I kind of panicked I'm like Man, that, that's how you get onto my network here, guy. You know, if you need to, if you need to get on, you've got to hook up Wi-Fi. So, well, I can't, can't do that. So, I 
fuddled around and found a nice 25 foot cable that was 20, 10 years old at the at, at the very least and we managed to hook her um her specialty device up for her to for her to get in so some of the things you have to think about is you know when you have a single pipe you're all in an office you, you've only got one you've only got one funnel to the outside world maybe two back up you know maybe you know some people three or four but um, in general, you're worrying about, you know, offices that have many people in it. Now, I guess what you got to think about, you got to think about the security at every single house, every single location where this person works from. They don't just work from their house. Maybe they, they've they got other locations they, they work at. You know, you got to be thinking about that. Is VPN, your company-specific VPN solution, good enough security for you? It may not be. Perhaps your VPN solution utilizing a two-factor authentication um, to, um, would would be sufficient for you. As long as you're doing, you know, encrypted traffic back to your company and you have to prove who you are, that might be good enough for you. But guess what? There are companies that that is not good enough. Um, what are other people at your home doing? You know, are they, you know, they're they're people playing games, bogging things down. Um, could that potentially penetrate the security of, um, of of your company? There's there's things to to think about there. Um, do you need um, a hardware device like Fortinet or WatchGuard? I mean, GSI's been looking into it. We've been evaluating and implementing Fortinet devices. Um, I th they're not so easy to configure. Um, Though um, I think some of those devices called the SD WAN type devices are. Um, they somewhat speak their own language. I've been doing network administration for 30 plus years and I had started looking at a Fortinet device and I'm like, they were talking their own language. I've got, I'm certified in the Cisco IOS. I, I mean, things I know. And now I call up the sales guy and say, I've got to go back to school to learn how to use your device. He's like, yep. And those are things you have to think about. Do you need a device that truly isolates your work equipment from the rest of what's going on at your home? Um, so I just, you know, kind of wanted to think about it. Do you need a, do you, does your person need a um, voice over IP phone or a cell phone? You know, how are you going to manage, manage that? Perhaps you already do, you know, maybe your company already provides your, your people with mobile phones, but you know, maybe they don't, you know, when they're working from home, they, if they're paying for their own cell phone, they, they might complain and say, Hey, look, you know, um, I, this is, uh, you know, I'm paying for all this time and bandwidth myself. It's for the company. Can you pay for it? Those are the things you have to think about. So, Todd, that's really all I have to say on this one. Okay. And a quick side note on that, you know, it may be just your finance team that needs the additional security layer and not your entire remote workforce. So, again, hybrid solutions, I think, definitely needs to be considered. It's not going to be a one solution fits every remote worker. All right, let me move on. All right, remote employees, um, confirming the technology platforms you're going to rely on, specifically, you know, video conferencing, task management, and job duties. Task management is another thing, out of sight, out of mind. Um, we'll get into this some more in a couple slides, but making sure that work is getting done, you know, for an unseen coworker, it's it's one of the things that people have reached out to us and asked about. Um, I believe we have a whole slide for that. <laughs> but uh, having the technology there to handle that is is going to be critical communication rhythms again you know you can't just walk over to somebody's desk or have an impromptu meeting at the office if everybody's remote so making sure there's a good structure and rhythm to their work schedule and their work day um, like a daily huddle for teams you know we're gonna we recommend first thing in the morning where you ensure everybody's got their focus and plan for the entire day um, to start out their day. It's it's good to have first thing in the morning. Um, with 
everything that's going on now, we would also recommend confirming policies on travel, sick pay, and working schedules. Can, can you be a little more flexible with the work schedule if everybody's remote, depending on what the job duty is? Um, we have that flexibility with what we do. A lot of our techs have to work in the evening. Do we allow a two, two and a half hour lunch because we know they're going to work that evening? You bet. Um, again, this is going to be based on the different teams and but something to consider. You know, one disadvantage to working from home is you're always at the office. Uh, when I first started working remote, I found myself working 18, 19 hours a day because it was just, I could run over, sit at my desk and get something done. Um, but you got to have some work-life balance and keep reminding your folks of that so that they don't fall into the always working and, you know, being regretting it. Um, but the ability for them to jump in and deal with something early in the day or later in the day is definitely an advantage. Um, make sure that, you know, the focus is there. Um, regularly talking to people. Again, communication is going to be so critical with remote workers, um, keeping their focus and making sure everybody's on the same page. All right. Um, ensuring accountability. Uh, this is a big one. This is one that we've been asked quite a bit about over the past two weeks. Um, as I had just said, beginning the day with team touch point calls, what's the plan for the day? What is each person gonna have tasked on their plate? Um, it's a very good cadence. We do a lot of our team calls first thing in the morning with the different teams to ensure everybody's got their plan on the same page and following up from the previous day, uh, very similar to development scrum calls. What did you get accomplished yesterday? What's your goals today? What are the roadblocks? And everybody on the team has input, visibility, and knows what people are working on. It's critical. Uh, instant message responsiveness, reaching out and pinging users in your team on IM and gauging their responsiveness. Does it have to be instant? No, but reasonable, yes. Uh, if you don't hear back from them in a half an hour to an hour, might need a phone call. What's going on? What are you working on? Um, IT admin setting up group policies for instant message to show in a way status when they're idle. Um, implementing that if there's no activity on the laptop or VM, or virtual desktop, however they're, you know, whatever they're utilizing for a workstation to go idle in screen share mode and lock screen. For one aspect, it's secure. They walk away, you don't want somebody else in the household come over a child and bring up something and download anything. Um, so it's a security factor, but it also will be reflective in instant message, you'll quickly be able to see your team and if they're away or busy or screen share or available. Um, it's a really good way to ensure accountability. Meeting minutes. Um, ours has really grown over the years into a very, very good standard. Um, right at the beginning, we have attendance. So, I know the people that run the meetings at GSI, we will prep before the call and list out attendees that were invited. And we quickly, you know, five minutes into the meeting, we'll update who attended. We might review it at the end of the call and, you know, somebody joined late and, you know, just mark it that they were there. Um, it's just easy to gray out who didn't make it. Um, that helps for accountability and knowing who heard what was on the meeting, but also meeting minutes of what was discussed, what was covered. There is going to be a lot of multitasking where people aren't focused on the meeting. They're trying to get something else done because they're not sitting in a conference room. They're able to do that and do two things at once. 
well, they might not have fully heard what was covered. Um, so having the meeting minutes to refresh the details is critical or the people that got pulled into something else and weren't able to make the meeting. Again, those notes and minutes are going to be very helpful so that they're on the same page. Um, setting daily tasks for individuals. There are some people that aren't good with working remote. Um, they're not a go-getter or they're easily distracted. Those individuals, their managers and you know leaders should know those people or be able to identify it pretty quickly. Um, you might have to ensure that you're assigning them work and giving them you know, realistic deadlines to get it completed. Not everybody in a remote work environment is gonna be a go-getter and start reaching out and asking their coworkers, hey, I've got some bandwidth, what else can you uh, throw over on my plate? Can I help you with anything you're working on? Um, so keep an eye on that and identify those people. It's not that they're terrible, it just, they have a different personality and need work assigned. Um, and they may grow out of that. The more they get into good work habits at home, that, that might change. We've seen it happen with a few of our folks. Needed more babysitting or, you know, watching, and they got into a good rhythm. Um, daily or weekly status summary. Um, that I would recommend starting out weekly. Daily can be a bit much, um, but I would tailor it to the teams or the individuals as needed. Um, and also, you may or may not need this based on what you do for time entry and task tracking. Uh, if you're using a tool like Asana and assigning tasks, that method, maybe you don't need a status summary. Um, but it is something that is useful. Uh, we learned it, or I learned it, working for JD Edwards and traveling on site to clients. My manager, I would provide a weekly summary of what I did each day and what got accomplished, um, just to keep them in the loop and let them know what I was working on. Um, Asana is probably more universal and flexible, but if not Asana, Microsoft Project is another good planning tool. If you're working more on larger scale projects with the team, utilizing Microsoft Project more often, I know certain teams at GSI use it and rely on it a lot, where a lot of our other teams get by with Asana or an Asana type tool. Um, I believe even Salesforce, well, I know they do. I don't know to the extent um, but they have task tracking capabilities in Salesforce, if you already have that. Um, consistent one-on-one -on -one meetings. Ensure your managers and you yourself are meeting with your people on a regular, consistent basis. Um, again, depending on the needs, initially it might be a once a week. And as things work and get the flow going better, moving it out to every other week or once a month. Um, just to ensure that you're getting their feedback on the pros and cons of the remote change, um, what they're working on, what they're getting accomplished. And video meetings to ensure continuity and that personal touch. Again, you know, a lot of people will assume the worst reading text messages in email. It's very hard to convey tone. Um, verbal meetings and video conferencing is a huge way to overcome that. And again, you know, this may not suit everybody, um, but it's definitely things that we've learned and adapted to over the years. Um, I like to look at video meetings as the water cooler time. Um, it just gives that personal touch to it. All right, I think I figured out what the slide deck was tricking me on. So hopefully won't have it jumping ahead as it was earlier. Uh, remote work pain points. Uh, this is a big one. 
This is a real, real big one. Um, background noises. Ensure that they're utilizing a quiet office workspace. Um, the big thing on etiquette is mute when you're not speaking. There's a lot of background noises, and with the technology of the headsets that we have nowadays, it will pick up absolutely everything. Our biggest thing that we started pushing years back is if you're not speaking on the call at the time, please mute. Um, it's gotten to the point where we have some of our large team department calls where it's 40, 50 people. We have one person assigned to watching for background noise and muting people. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Um, the culture has adapted to it. And oh, I lied about the except except for me, I'm all, except for me, I'm always making noises, people <laughs> chewing in the background, you know, while they're while they're on the phone. You may not seem like a big deal, even when you're face to face, if you might be munching on some chips or something. But trust me, when you're on a call, it's like a noise yeah. all get out. Yeah, and right now in this time, um, kids are not going to school. So there's kids in the background of varying ages, dogs, yard work going on, you know, spouses outside with a leaf blower. Um, it's going to take some training of the people that are remote to start planning those things, um, find stuff and, you know, okay, I've got to be on conference calls during this hour and this hour, being coordinate so that you can reduce that noise factor as much as possible. Um, other aspects to conference calls, uh, agendas. Uh, we require it when, when our people send out meetings to have an agenda in the invite. Um, if I get one, if I get an invite and there's no agenda, I decline it and I tell them, I need an agenda. Um, it it helps meeting sprawl or tangents. It keeps things focused so that meetings, you get things covered that need to be covered in the time allotted. Um, it helped GSI reduce a lot of our one hour meetings to a half hour. When you're focused and have a bullet point list of what needs to be covered, it really helps as a time saving tool. Um, let the call leader run the call. They, you know, will be able to turn it over to other people when they cover their topics. Um, quality headsets, speaker phone on uh, mobile or some laptops don't have the greatest speakers. Um, finding out what works for a really good quality headset. Uh, there's lots of Bluetooth ones out there, and it really helps to ensure you're hearing people and not asking people to repeat themselves. Um, distractions. As I talked about before, some people do not work well remotely. I don't Me. recommend, you know, <laughs> I don't recommend people sitting on their couch in front of the TV and their laptop plopped on the coffee table. I know there's some that can do it that way and just mute everything. But for me, I, I have a room set aside that's an office and that's all that's there is work. Um, it keeps me focused. It, if there's any comp company policies going out or recommendations, definitely find your space that you can focus and not be distracted. You know, on the dining room table, probably not the best idea. Ideally, a den or an office. Um, I converted a spare bedroom into an office just so I had more space. Um, I do have coworkers that are local come over and will do training. So I have two desk setups and whiteboard and everything. Uh, it does help. Gives you the in-office feel at home. But it's also a way that I can shut off or step away from work at the end of the day. I can close the door to that room and go out and, you know, if I've got my office set up temporarily in the living room or in the kitchen or dining room, I'm walking by it all the time. I can't step away from work. Um, so it helps having that separate room or separate office space really helps 
separate work from from life. Um, yeah, the staying focused, that's the tricky part. Um, I will step away and throw in a load of laundry in the morning. It's on the other side of the house, so I know it won't distract me from my calls. Um, but I can get little things here and there done. Call gets done early. I can step and do stuff. It is convenient. It is one, one of the positives, but it shouldn't be more than five, ten minutes. Um, you know, just real quick and then get back focused on work. Uh, one big pain point that every everywhere I've worked remote, it, it it comes up. Will the company pay for my internet? And the argument, well, now you're making me work remote. I have to, you know, I have to have internet. Well, you were coming into the office and you had to have a car to get into the office or pay for a bus or whatever. Transportation usually isn't covered by a company. Um, most most modern day households have internet. Um, so it's it's up to every company. I think it's a nice thing to do. I think it's a, a large expense. Um, but, but think about it before those questions come up and have a company standard, a company policy. Are you gonna do it? Or if you are, what are the limits? Is it a $40 reimbursement to offset the costs um, or paying everything. A lot of individuals are, you know, through the cable company where it's bundled with their TV bill. Um, but it's something that should be considered up front, decided, and shared out, stave off the questions and the ask later. All right, I believe we're getting close to one of the last slides here. Um, Remote work perks. Uh, I personally, I feel there's a lot of perks. And if you get a remote workforce that can do it and respect the company's time and put in a hard day's effort, it's, it opens up a lot of perks and options for a company or a corporation long term. Um, for individuals, there's no commute. It could be on average, an hour to two hours a day, they're saving of their personal time getting to and from the office. The wear and tear and cost on the vehicles, oil changes, brake pads, uh, fuel, that is a big time and cost savings to coming into the, or not coming into the office. Lunches, being able to eat and snacks at home, buying groceries instead of going out. When I worked out of an office, you know, 20 years ago, we'd all go out to lunch and I mean, we spend crazy amounts. You look back over a week or a month, that was a large expenditure out of my pocket. Um, for a corporation allowing remote workers, you've got the lower carbon footprint that you and your employees are putting on the planet. That's a big positive. Relocation options. We've got users that relocate all over the country, be closer to family, be in a nicer part of, you know, the U.S. Their spouse got a job offer in a different state. If you offer the relocation options to work remote and they can relocate and not have to find a new job, you're going to keep, you know, a dedicated, loyal worker. Uh, they'll probably be a lot more loyal and dedicate it. The long-term effects of possibly lowering your office overhead. Less employees in the office, less square footage requirement, less utility bills. You know, I worked for a large medical device company years ago and in where corporate headquarters was, we had 20 different buildings and they allowed a lot of remote work and were able to cut down the amount of buildings that they owned and paid for. Um, so communicating out, I believe at this time, that things are positive and are, this is like a test bed or a trial to open the opportunity to be a long-term option. And with that, I believe we, oh, the next slide here. Um, so with this, I know we kind of generalized a lot of it. Um, 
there we can't get real specific because it's client specific or company specific. But if there are things that we touched on here that you want to reach out and do a one hour consultation with our subject matter experts, let us know which topics and which pain points that you want to cover. And we'll get a call set up with the right individuals to talk in more depth and more detail to any pains or questions that you might have. And with that, Brittany, I believe you can take control back and we can open it up for a Q&A. Yep, thank you. Um, let me just get my screen showing here. All right, perfect. Um, thank you, John, Todd, and Josh. Now I'm just gonna cover a few follow-up items and then we'll move on to our question and answer section. Our educational web webcast today is a part of GSI's free ongoing educational webcast. We have a couple of upcoming webcasts here you see, um, and then you can also go to our website. Here at the, um, at the bottom, you can see where to go to register for those. We've got our ERP talk, which is our problem solving forum where you can get your JD Edwards and other enterprise application questions answered. Stay connected with us on social media. All of our handles are currently listed on the screen. You can see our most up-to-date posts on webcasts, in events, industry insights, and so much more. GSI provides extensive free educational resources for the JD Edwards community, including our weekly educational webcast, monthly newsletter called the GSI Insider, online resource center where you can access our on-demand webcasts, white papers, et cetera, on-site and virtual workshops. If you would like to sign up for our weekly email reminders for our upcoming webcast, our monthly newsletter, or to create an account or to access our resource center, go to getgsi.com, go to resources and events on the main menu, select JD Edwards, and then select the appropriate link on the right. All right, and now for our question and answer section, um, let me see what we have. We have a question from Stephen. He asked if, if the webinar is going to be available as a recording to share with others in my company. I can actually answer that one. It will. Um, everybody who attended the webcast today will receive an email with a link to access this um, webinar as well as it will be on our website. Okay, and then we have a question from Alex. Um, we are feeling overwhelmed with this new territory. Where do you recommend starting? I'm sorry, what was that again, Brittany? I didn't, I don't see where that question was. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you're feeling a little overwhelmed with this new territory. Where do you recommend starting? Um, the first thing as far as starting is identifying what what tools the teams that you want to be remote are going to require and how they're going to access it uh, will it be issuing you know the laptops or virtual desktop option uh, personally i feel the virtual desktops you know azure or amazon option is probably for quick turnaround the right solution up front and then assess if that's meeting the needs. Um, the nice thing I like about the virtual desktops, you only pay for what you need or what's being used. And it is fairly straightforward. Uh, one day we can get it, you know, connected to your domain through our IPsec tunnels. Um, so it's more of an extension and support wise. I feel it's the easiest. Does that help answer? Yeah, I, I, I have one comment I'd like to put at the top of the list too, maybe not at the very top, but right after that. And that is to get definitely get make sure that your ticket tracking system is in place, some form, even if it's just an email box, you know, some something. Um, so that you can prioritize the number of requests that come in. Right. 
in getting your service desk or help desk, you know, using the same remote um, work options so that they're learning it and know it and are able to support it quickly. Um, you know, we, we're seeing hundreds of people at companies, you know, one, 850 employees have to work remote and they're dealing with technology that they've never supported before. Um, so getting your support teams able to support and use those same tools so they can turn things around quicker and make sure people are able to work. You don't want the technology to be the pain point to stop them from doing their, their job. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, okay, well that appears to be the end of our questions for today. Um, if you have any other questions, Todd and my contact information is here on the screen if you wanna take that down. You can reach out to either one of us and we'll get those questions to you. And then as a follow-up from today's webcast, we ask that you complete a short one-minute survey when you exit. You'll be receiving an email with a link to our resource center on today's webcast where you can ac access the recording from today's webcast as well as a copy of the presentation. After today's webcast, we'll do a drawing for the $25 Amazon gift card. Anyone who attended the entire webcast will be eligible and then we'll notify the winner. Um, and like I said, if you have any other questions or anything, please reach out um, and thank you for attending.